All right. Um, so thank you all so much for being here and for um, the folks who were able to donate to Pride. I know that they appreciate it so much. And um, we're so excited about this like second year um, of the festival in Brunswick. Um, so I'm Lauren Dottillo. I am the um, Director of Education at Psychology Specialists of Maine. Um, and we're really glad to see all of you with us today. So our presenter today is Ray Egbert. Um, they are a staff psychologist and the coordinator of the Center for LGBTQ plus community supports with psychology specialists of Maine. They earned their PsyD in clinical psychology from Long Island University Post. They also hold a graduate degree in LGBTQ health policy and practice from the George Washington University and a JD with a concentration in child and family law from Capital University Law School. It's a mouthful. They specialize in working with uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community, as well as with their partners and family members, and have expertise in treating trauma and stress related disorders and substance use disorders and other addictive behaviors. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Ray and we will get started. Thank you so much, Lauren, um, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'm so stoked to be here and uh, to be talking about Pride and a history of Pride. I have my my Pride shirt on today. I'm manifesting good weather. Um, it's a uh, 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 Pride uh, ice cream cones, um, but it's freezing cold out. Uh, it's freezing cold in my office, um, but uh, I'm manifesting that it's June and we're here in Pride Month and uh, that I'm celebrating with all of you. So. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I've titled my talk today, uh, A History of Pride, and I, I realized that I changed it uh, this weekend when I was working on it because um, our, our flyer that we sent out said, The History of Pride. And I recognized that when I was working on it that I couldn't possibly talk about the entirety of the history of pride, nor would it be appropriate for me to call it the history of pride, um, because this is just sort of my uh, recognition and my reflection and, and uh, sort of my views um, and so I'm calling it a history of pride, and I'm hoping that um, we can have a, a really robust and, and um, fruitful conversation and just discussion about pride um, and about what this month means to the community. We're in a, a really unique time for the community um, this year and, and the past two years as things have really changed with a lot of uh, political and, and sort of social um, experiences. And, and that's going to be a main part of, of what I talk about the back half of this. But I want to share a lot about um, the origins of Pride and not just through the lens of Stonewall, which may be what some of you have heard about. Um, I want to sort of share about some of even what comes before that and sort of how that sets the stage for uh, what we're experiencing in this current socio-political climate. Um, so, um, without further ado, really, and maybe with one, maybe further caveat, I'm going to use the terms queer, um, and LGBT, um, and I use those to talk about sort of inclusively the entirety of the community. Um, so if you hear those words, please know that I'm talking about, uh, LGBTQIA plus and, and all the other letters of the alphabet, um, but I'll use those, uh, sort of interchangeably throughout my discussion. All right, so I'm gonna start, um, I would really like this to be um, as um, interactive, this conversation uh, that we have over the course of the next hour as possible. So I'm gonna start with a bunch of questions. Please feel free to use the chat function uh, that we have going um, or to um, unmute yourself if you feel brave and, and you'd like to talk with the group. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple of questions and, and you can feel free to raise your hands for this one. I can see um, several of you. Um, um, or to write in the chat, that would also be wonderful if you're willing to do so. Um, but who amongst this group of folks um, have been to or celebrated at a Pride event, whether that's in the state of Maine um, or maybe in other states? Um, how many folks have we got? I'm going to sort of expand here. Or please, again, write in the chat. I'm seeing a lot of hands going up, which is wonderful. Awesome. So many folks. Good. Great, loving these answers. Yes, resounding yeses, which is great. All right, and who here knows um, knows about or knows what the Stonewall riots are uh, and knows about the history of Stonewall? Um, go ahead and uh, you can raise your hands for that or um, write in the responses there about uh, your knowledge about Stonewall. Uh, 
uh, some hands raised, some folks. Ray, could I just blow it in for a minute? This is Doug Kimmel. Uh, I don't know how widely it's known that the Stonewall riots happened on the evening after Judy Garland's memorial service in New York City. Wow. Which really fueled a lot of the psychological energy because, of course, Judy Garland was Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, and a lot of gay people identified with that movie because of the uh, star man, the tin man, and the cowardly lion they kind of felt acquainted. And during the World War II, people identified themselves as being a friend of Dorothy's if they were gay. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for uh, chiming in with that one. Yeah, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Stonewall today um, and share a little bit about Stonewall, but I appreciate, Doug, you for uh, sharing about that and for sharing about the impact of uh, Wizard of Oz in particular on the community. Thank you. How about folks uh, knowing why the rainbow flag is a symbol of the queer community and who created it? Again, you can feel free to raise your hand here uh, or to um, write in the chat. Yeah, I know something about that or know a little bit about that. I've seen it. Most folks have seen it, I suspect. So some folks are saying, yeah, I know about it, but I don't know who created it. So we're going to talk a lot more about that person today. Um, Pride Month, I think many of you know, Pride Month uh, is an opportunity for us to uh, uplift the queer voices, to celebrate culture, to support our rights. It is really uh, an opportunity in, in many ways uh, to celebrate the activism and culture of the community throughout the years. I think Doug just pointed out really beautifully for us that Stonewall is born out of uh, riots that started in 1969. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes, um, but that really was brewing for many, many years um, prior to that. And that's what I wanna highlight. A lot of folks know what Stonewall is and, and know about Stonewall in particular, um, but I wanna highlight some of what was going on prior to that and what led to that um, in particular. Um, I like talking about our flag because I think this is maybe one of the things that um, is most uh, synonymous with the queer community. Um, you're seeing what is the original um, LGBT flag here in the middle. It was created by uh, an artist and designer, a Vietnam War veteran, and at the time, a drag performer named Gilbert Baker, and that was in 1978. And then you're seeing along the side here um, an evolution of, of our flags. Um, so the, the flag has changed many times over the year. And this one on the bottom, so the bottom right there, is a flag that you see maybe most commonly, um, although I, I think... Um, we're seeing lots of different versions in more recent years, but this is the more progressive flag that we see. It includes um, the trans flag in there. It includes um, colors for uh, members of the BIPOC community. So this flag there on the bottom right is the one that we're starting to see more and more, and that was created in, in more recent years. But let's go back to um, Gilbert Baker in 1978 for just a minute, because this is where our flag really starts to, um, to come into its own. So uh, Gilbert Baker, as I mentioned, was an artist and a designer. He was a war veteran and a drag performer. Um, he was commissioned to create this flag by a very well-known gay icon, and that was Mr. Harvey Milk. Um, and this was commissioned for um, San Francisco's annual Pride Parade again in 1978. Um, and, and this really proved to be fairly uh, serendipitous because um, Baker had been thinking about a flag and uh, how to make something that would represent the queer community um, for about two years by this point. Um, he told the Museum of Modern Art in 2015 that he had really been inspired by the 1976 uh, celebrations of America's bicentennial. Um, uh, sort of thinking about the stars and stripes and, and sort of recognizing like, hey, what about the queer community? Like, why don't we have a flag? Why don't we have something that uh, can sort of be more of a rallying sign for, for our community? He really saw flags generally as a powerful symbol of pride and he wanted something like that for our community. Um, 
the, the, the most prominent symbol of the community at the time was the, um, the, the sort of burgeoning image of using that pink triangle, which had been used by Nazis to identify homosexuals. And he didn't really think that that was something that like he wanted to, to be synonymous with our community. So he didn't want that dark and painful past to be an option. He wanted to use this rainbow as inspiration. Um, so he took to the rainbow, our natural sort of rainbow from the sky, um, and adopted eight colors um, for the stripes. And each one had a significant meaning from his perspective. Um, and this is what you see here um, on the original eight flags uh, stripe. Again, he said in an interview, our job as gay people is to come out, to be visible, to live in truth, as I say, to get out of the lie. And a flag really fit that mission because that's a way of proclaiming your visibility and of saying, this is who I am. So this was an original sort of um, thought and um, an experience of Baker back then in 1978. And it took about 30 volunteers to make that original flag, which is still on display um, at the Gay Community Center in San Francisco um, and has been recreated and represented in many ways um, throughout uh, time. And you see there on the side, again, um, how it's been uh, changed and, and recreated and um, redesigned and redeveloped throughout the years. Um, and what I have appreciated, and I could have put all the flags of all of the different uh, pieces of the queer community on here, but I'm focusing on our sort of uh, original flag because I think it's really uh, a wonderful way to think about and to talk about um, the starting points uh, of our community. All right, so why June? Um, June, again, as we just mentioned uh, a little bit ago, um, is the month in which the Stonewall, Stonewall Uprising took place. And this is really seen as the tipping point for what is known as the modern day uh, gay liberation movement. Um, it was 1969 when Stonewall happened. And then a year later, when that first march took place, uh, from Stonewall to Central Park, which now is recognized as the nation's first gay pride parade. Um, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to show a brief clip um, of a, uh, a, um, a, uh, a clip from the History Channel that talks about the Stonewall riots. I, I hope that this um, comes through okay. I just think that this uh, video will give us a um, ability to to hear and think about this um, from the perspective of um, some folks who were there at the time, and then we can talk about this more specifically. So I'm hoping that my video works okay and and folks will hear this right. If if not, Lauren, will you just let me know if um, the video doesn't uh, the sound doesn't come through all right? Okay, sorry, it looks like I'm gonna have to stop sharing. It's not playing through there. So just give me one quick second. Northeastern is empowering me to make an impact in environmental policy. Give me really Morning hours of June 28, 1969, a riot broke out in front of the Stonewall Inn in New York City. The violent protest became known as the Stonewall Riots. The Stonewall Riots were a watershed moment in the gay rights movement, sparking activism and awareness across the United States. We'll look at the roots of the riots, the events, and their lasting impact. In the 1950s and 60s, homosexuality was still considered sodomy and illegal in 49 states. The punishments varied greatly by state, ranging from heavy fines to imprisonment. In society, members of the gay community were often subject to violence, harassment, and discrimination. In New York City, gay bars were havens for people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities, places where they could avoid harassment and violence. The Stonewall Inn served as a popular refuge. The Stonewall Inn was owned by the Mafia. The Mafia bribed the police to look the other way. In turn, 
the Mafia made money overcharging patrons for drinks. Even so, the patrons were not fully safe from homophobia and discrimination. The Mafia would extort wealthy patrons, threatening to out them to their employers and families. Despite the Mafia's bribes, the police still regularly raided the Stonewall Inn and other gay bars, charging them with solicitation of homosexual relations. Trans and other gender nonconforming people were also targeted, subjected to violence, and arrested if they weren't wearing what the police deemed gender-appropriate clothing. This oppression and mistreatment came to a head in the early morning hours of June 28, 1969. Nine police officers entered the Stonewall Inn in a raid. The patrons were fed up. As the police roughly tried to arrest bartenders and customers, many resisted. Outside the bar, people in the hundreds began rioting. They threw bottles at the police and pushed through the barricades. The police officers retreated from the crowd and locked themselves inside the Stonewall Inn. Rioters responded by setting the bar on fire. Police reinforcement arrived and the original officers managed to get out of the burning bar. Meanwhile, the angry mob had grown into thousands. Eventually, the police were able to get the crowd to disperse, but it didn't last long. The riots continued until July 1st. While some criticized the violent and destructive riots, others pointed to the brutality and unjust treatment of the gay community. This large-scale defiance made a massive impact on society. The Stonewall Riots were the beginning of the modern gay liberation movement, which also brought attention to others marginalized for their sexual or gender orientation. The riots sparked the formation of the Gay Liberation Front, the first group to publicly advocate for equal gay rights. On the one-year anniversary of the riots, they also organized the first Gay Pride Parade. Today, Pride events are still held on the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots in cities around the country and even the world. In 2016, President Obama made the Stonewall Inn and the area outside where the riots broke out a national monument. This became the first national monument celebrating gay history. The Stonewall riots may have been violent, but they marked a pivotal moment in history. No longer would people quietly endure the stigma associated with their sexual and gender orientations. Through the Stonewall riots, the gay rights movement gained mainstream visibility and a momentum that continues to this day. Okay. So um, just like if folks want to share their thoughts um, about this brief video or any thoughts um, in the um, chat here while I'm gathering up my switching back to our regular screen, I'd so appreciate it. Let me just make a brief comment again. Sure. Uh, psychologically, what the riots did uh, was to change an individual condition to a group identity. I became we. And that transformation, I think, has been the most powerful psychological shift uh, in our history. Yeah, thank you so much. Like we're going to talk about that. I'm going to share some voices directly from folks at um, Stonewall and in a uh, couple of uh, slides. I think that is one of the most powerful shifts that that we have seen, and and it's one of the most important pieces of this. And that's why I want to go back and share um, a couple of pieces of history that folks may not know about. Um, I think Stonewall, a lot of folks do know about. Uh, maybe not the 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 smaller pieces of this or how or why it started, but at least the name of it, folks maybe have some recognition about. Um, again, uh, this was mostly covered. I hadn't decided if I wanted to share a clip and I decided um, maybe that clip could do a better job of explaining it than I could. Um, but uh, I'm gonna focus if I can for a moment on some of the riots and demonstrations that were happening prior to 1969. And this may be, um, the reason I'm, I'm gonna do this is because this e explains precisely the shift that Doug is talking about from the from the me to the we that really started this, this monumental shift in how people experience um, uh, who who they are, how they are, how they engage with with, with the world, and um, so I wanted to share these pieces because it was in learning about this piece of history that um, uh, really was uh, uh, quite life changing in, uh, for me in understanding some of these pieces. So I'd like to share it with you, if I may. 
Um, I'm going to take us back to about 10 years prior to Stonewall for a moment uh, and the Cooper Donuts riot, which happened in LA in May of 1959. And this was, again, a full decade. So we're talking 10 full years before uh, Stonewall. And uh, this was a donut shop in LA and police faced an angry crowd uh, when they tried to round up the gay men, the trans women, uh, drag queens, folks who had frequented this uh, late night LA coffee shop. And as had happened before on occasions when officers entered the, uh, the donut, shop, donut shop, Coopers, they demanded ID. And if customers' gender presentation didn't match the gender on the, their ID, they were starting to take folks to jail. This was a regular practice for them. What happened was they attempted to arrest several customers, um, including an author um, whose name was John uh, Rishi, who recounted the incident that happened that night. Um, but onlookers had had enough. They basically said, like, no, thank you. They started to uh, throw coffee and donuts and trash. And the cops basically on that night for the first time fled empty handed. And the riots then started to spread out into the streets and police uh, police backup showed up, they tried to block off Main Street, and they tried to arrest more folks. Um, and this incident, 1959, is considered one of the first LGBT uprisings in the U.S. Um, and, you know, as a queer person, um, I didn't know about this until I really went back and started digging into queer history. Um, you know, we all know about Stonewall, right? But, um, you know, unless you really go back and do your digging, unless you uh, really are uh, being educated on this stuff, you don't know about it. And I think it's really important. And it's why I wanted to share with you all today about some of these lesser known things, because this is, again, a full 10 years before. So um, let me bring it back to um, the East Coast for us. Um, I'm gonna go down a couple here to Dewey's Lunch Counter. This is in Philly in 1965. So we're coming up a few years. We're getting a little closer to Stonewall. Um, so Dewey's was a chain of hamburger joints and this is in Philly. And we're uh, near Rittenhouse Square, if you know that area. And this was a popular gathering spot for young queer folks. Um, and after an encounter with a uh, uh, sort of some uh, rowdy teens, some gender conforming folks, the employees started to begin refusing service and they were refusing service to any customers that they believed uh, were gay or otherwise challenging gender norms. So on April 25th, 1965, 150 people were refused service at the eatery. And working in conjunction with local gay rights groups, uh, three teenagers walked into Dewey's that day and they staged a sit-in. Um, the demonstrators uh, who had come down to help, they were all soon arrested and they were charged with disorderly conduct. And in the wake of the arrest, um, folks started picketing Dewey's, they started distributing uh, thousands of leaflets all over the next week or so. And about a week after the initial demonstration, another smaller sit-in took place. And the police arrived this time, uh, but this time there were no arrests. And Dewey stopped denying service to people who appeared homosexual or gender nonconforming. And this incident uh, is known as the first sit-in of its kind in the history of the US. So this is the first time that folks um, uh, um, uh, sort of showed up in this way in the sort of like pre-planned sit-in advocacy sort of space and, and sort of demanded like, no, we're gonna do something different. All right. I really like this one um, uh, because uh, I don't know, it's sort of uh, I just like the the way it sort of works out this one. Um, this one is called the Julius Sip In. And uh, this is in New York City. Again, we're getting closer and closer to uh, Stonewall. This is in 1966. In the 1960s, as you heard in the um, uh, video about related to Stonewall in the 1960s, New York State, the Liquor Authority had barred um, establishments from serving alcohol to homosexuals. And to demonstrate a, um, against this policy, members of the Mattachine Society, they had sort of taken a page from uh, other civil rights movements. And they walked into Julius's in New York City's uh, West Village and announced they were homosexuals and they asked to be served. Um, and they weren't. Um, but with the help of the ACLU, the Mattachine Society, they filed discrimination charges um, with the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And the whole thing ends up in court, right? And the court decides, well, yeah, the Constitution says that people have the right to peacefully assemble and the state can't take that right away from you. Uh, and so the Liquor Authority, they can't prevent people from congregating in bars. 
So this sip in marks the first time that the community, the queer community fights back and wins in court. Um, and so there's a, a quote from uh, someone from the Mattachine Society that says, you know, we just sort of took in everything passively. We didn't do anything about it. Um, but this time we did. This time we fight back. This time we take it to court. And you know what? We win. Um, and so this is a, a time when uh, we start to see uh, taking things to court. And you see things then across history um, where uh, we are fighting for our rights in courts and, and winning. Um, and that's a, a big shift. All right, um, so let's bring us to the Black Cat protests. And again, we're gonna go back to the West Coast here. We're gonna go to LA in February of 1967. And um, it actually starts on New Year's Day of 67 when undercover cops raid the Black Cat Tavern. And this is in Silver Lake and they're um, uh, quite violent brandishing guns and, and beating patrons. Um, and a bartender was pulled across the bar and, and uh, really gets hurt and broken up. And several folks, drag queens and other queer folks are arrested, uh, two men in particular, after engaging in a New Year's kiss. And the couple was convicted of lewd conduct and they had to register as sex offenders. Um, it was a, a very violent um, event that had happened. And, and weeks later, a couple hundred protesters had picketed for days in front of the tavern. And it marks the first time that there had been this like, um, uh, you know, organized um, picketing event against the police harassment. And they were met by, you know, squadrons of, of armed officers, but yet still they continue their peaceful protests. Um, and the Black Cat Raid and their subsequent demonstrations inspired Richard Mitch and Bill Rao to turn a local gay rights newsletter into the Los Angeles Advocate, which soon became The Advocate, um, which is known as the nation's first national LGBT news magazine, which uh, is a tremendous magazine, has done wonderful work for uh, the community. And in 2008, the Black Cat was designated as the first Los Angeles historic cultural monument, and it was landmarked for its significant role in queer history. And let's see, I'm just looking at the time. Let's see this last one, which is Patch Riot, and it brings us up real close to Stonewall. And um, Patch Riot, again, we're in LA, and uh, this is August of 68. The uh, police had repeatedly told uh, Lee Glaze, who was the owner of Long Beach's The Patch, that in order to stay open, he had to ban um, the drag acts, the physical contact, and the male-to-male -male dancing. Um, but um, basically, he just said no. <laughs> Um, you know, um, he'd warn his customers when undercover officers were in the bar by playing God Save the Queen on the jukebox. Um, and he continued to own and operate that um, that space in the way that he wanted. Um, but on August 17th, 1968, the vice squad arrived and demanded IDs and they were making these arbitrary arrests. And Glaze jumped up on the stage and yelled, it's not against the law to be homosexual and it's not a crime to be in a gay bar. He then led the customers in protest chants and told them he'd cover the legal costs if he got arrested, if they got arrested. A um, couple of folks were arrested uh, for lewd conduct and these types of things. But unlike other clashes between um, gay bar goers and the police, the patch remained open that night. Uh, the band resumed playing and several hundred people kept dancing the night away. So for the first time in memory, a gay bar not only survived the aftermath of a police raid, um, but it thrived. And this was thanks to the bar managers taking on the police on their home turf. And there was another important first that night. Instead of fleeing, never to return, customers stood by the patch after the raid. So um, these are a couple of, from, from my perspective and from history's perspective, important firsts um, in, in our history. And so I wanted to, to share them um, with all of you so that so that you could know um, about them, so you could hear about them, so you could hear about some of the history. Um, and again, I'll encourage you to share some thoughts in the chat um, about these or about how you're sitting with these, how they're resonating with you. Um, I see that a couple are, are coming in. Um, and uh, yeah. These are those voices 
from Stonewall that um, that I wanted to share. Um, and and, I, and I'm, I'm going to give a moment here to let these really um, to let you all have a moment to read them and, and let them resonate. Uh, I think Doug said it best um, in saying that this really moved from from the we um, from the me to the we. Um, but I'm just going to I'm going to pause and be quiet and let folks read for a moment. I'd like to open it up, if I may, um, let sort of folks speak to or reflect on um, some of what we have heard over the last couple of moments here, and, and just maybe speak to what you're reading here on the voices from Stonewall. Just thoughts about, um, yeah, how, how you're how this is sort of sitting or reflecting or resonating with you. And I can't see if hands are raising, so um, feel free to just sort of unmute yourself or write in the chat, those kinds of things. Yeah, Wendy is saying, um, I no longer felt alone, that is powerful. I couldn't agree with you more, Wendy. It's a really powerful statement. And you I sort was, of see that as a sentiment across many of these. Sorry, I interrupted someone. So I was thinking just before you put these quotes up, like how, how, scary it must have been how courageous these people were and that they had no idea what the short-term or long-term impact was going to be and this quote by Charles Valentino Harris really sums it up um they stood up that night not knowing they stood up for all of us they stood up because they were tired they didn't know they were rebelling for all generations mm -hmm. that is really striking mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, every time I read that one, I get the chills. Every time I read all of these, I get the chills, truthfully. I'm going to, I'm going to bring us up in time just a little, if I may. And I, 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 I purposefully sort of created this slide to be a little um, inundating um, with information because I um, I think it's important in sort of speaking to what um, what our our you know queer ancestors went through and leading up to to Stonewall and, and that night in 1969, um, we have sort of, um, a shift has happened in, in, in recent years and particularly um, in, the, in the last couple of years, um, what's happening to our queer communities, particularly uh, trans and non-binary folks. Um, and uh, I'm going to direct your attention to the, the middle of the screen here that where it says the ACLU is tracking 491 anti-LGBTQ bills in the U.S. I've been giving talks um, over the course of the past couple of months, and that number, I have to I have to wait to put that piece on every slide deck I create until the day before because that number keeps changing. I've watched it just creep up and up and up and up. Um, and it's it's astounding how high that number is. But I really wanted all of us to sort of have a sense of what the backdrop of Pride in, in 2023 looks like this year, um, because it somehow feels different this year than it's felt in years past. And, and there's a number of reasons for that, right? What's happening in Florida, what's happening in Texas, what's happening in other states where pretty significant anti-LGBT legislation is happening just 
on Friday, you know, three days ago on Friday, Texas passed very strict anti-trans legislation um, that prohibits, you know, major sort of gender affirming care for trans young people and, and can risk medical providers losing their licenses uh, for providing gender affirming care. Um, we have companies that like like Target, Anheuser Busch, that have you know generally said like yeah we're supportive of the community we're providing you know pride related content X Y and Z and have faced major backlash. Um, mental health concerns are growing among our young people, um, and not just because we have good data on on our young people, we have good. Um, data collection from places like the Trevor Project and those kinds of things. We don't have as good uh, data on, on um, LGBT older, uh, old, uh, LGBT adults, although recent um, trans surveys uh, were taken in the last uh, 12 months. So we should have data pretty soon on some, on, especially on, on trans adults. Um, but we know mental health is at major risk for, for LGBT folks. And yeah, there's, there's, it's 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 scary really to think about um what the backdrop backdrop of pride looks like um coming into 2023 i was i was talking to some other folks who do this kind of work specifically with the lgbt community whether that's in the legal field or the mental health field or the medical field um and not only are the people that we work with um in at higher risk and in higher need but our providers um, who do this work specifically are in greater fear. Will I lose my license? Um, how can I provide this care most effectively? Um, people are getting death threats, you know, for providing the work that they provide. Um, it's it's kind of a scary you know, sort of um, climate to be trying to provide care. And um, so it's, I say all of this to just sort of have us thinking about where our patients are at, where our colleagues are at, um, where all of us are in sort of this year, 2023, as we walk into Pride Month. Um, and as scary as it is, or as concerning as it is, or as worried as many of us are, there's also a great deal of, of pride and of celebration and of, of relief, again, as we move from this me to we, and Doug, I'm gonna keep using your words because I like them so much. Um, as we think about how do we create structures and systems that build community, um, that help us, and um, I think, I, I hope Summer, I'm getting your name right, uh, that it's Summer, that, that we join together, that we're able to live out loud, that we're able to create systems in which um, doing that helps to um, reduce sort of this impact of minority stress and create um, sort of some of the positive identity development that we know impacts that. So I, I guess I'll pause here for a moment um, and I'll maybe allow folks to, to speak to, and again, through the chat function, or if, if you're brave and you'd like to share um, some of what you're noticing either in patients that you work with or folks that you work with or in your communities or in yourself, um, fears or concerns or worries as we sort of move into Pride Month um, in the queer community. Monica says, I hope the pride is louder than the hate. And I agree with you, Monica. I really hope so too. I find myself kind of vacillating between this feeling of, um, I'm really glad to be in Maine, but also this feeling of like, you have to stay sort of vigilant because that idea of like, Oh, it's not here. Um, is is uh, you never know, right? Yeah, uh, you know, Lauren, I I appreciate that too. I you know, I uh, recently moving here and um, uh, getting settled. I, I moved to Maine about a year ago, um, and this feeling of like, oh, I'm in sort of like the safety of Maine, and it's wonderful. And then um, 
seeing some of the things that are even creeping up in Maine, like um, uh, some of the the efforts to ban certain books in some of our schools and, and some of the even just uh, thankfully a lot of these things were sort of quashed in, in some of our legal systems, but certain bills and certain things trying to be passed. It's a recognition that we can't be complacent, that we have to be vigilant. Um, I read a, a I read a great quote by a, a, a queer doctor who provides uh, care for um, trans folks. And um, they said that the, the, the best thing that any of us can do is to provide um, clear statements, any of us in any of our work about our acceptance and our commitment to care for uh, queer communities. And I thought, what a wonderful and and um, an impactful thing that folks can know where people are in terms of their their acceptance, their commitment to acceptance, their commitment to standing with and standing proud and standing tall in the face of um, you know, these never ending attacks. And, uh, and so I share that with all of you to say like, yeah, we're in a state that's very accepting. We're in a state that's very welcoming. We're in a state that's doing a lot of wonderful things. And yet each one of us can, can make a commitment to saying like, this is my stance. This is where I stand on this. And I'm going to make sure people know that this is where I stand on this. Um, I'm going to build on that for a minute, because one of the things I've learned over the years is that you can't tell by looking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't tell by looking at who's affirmative. Mm -hmm. People who are affirmative have to stand up and wave a flag or show up at meetings or speak out or write letters to the editor because otherwise they don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really beautifully said, Doug. I, I think um, it, it's why I, I really love that statement that that provider made is that, yeah, we can't tell by looking. We can never tell by looking. <laughs> that, and isn't that true on so many things? Um, and uh, what a wonderful way for allyship to show up to say, um, this, this is where I stand. Um, Summer, I'm, I'm noticing um, something that, uh, that you wrote um, in saying that, um, for a lot of folks, uh, for one of your patients had said like recently, like, uh, hey, being gay is no big deal now. So like, you know, we, we don't, uh, I think the, the point you're making is like, we don't need to talk about it. Like, it's okay, you know, like these kinds of things. Um, and I think what's, what's really tough and I think what you're pointing out and what you're getting at here is like the significant layers of internalized homophobia or internalized transphobia or like these ideas of, um, and I think, you know, some of what I've recognized is in, in the past, maybe, you know, let's call it, let's go back maybe five, 10 years ago, we were moving to this place of, you know, um, Supreme Court had sort of said, yeah, gay marriage is great. Like everything is wonderful. We can all do, you know, X, Y, Z. And then we saw this significant backlash in the other way. And um, I think there is this like strange sort of like, experience that some folks are having that many folks are having that it's like um a recognition of like where where am i how do i think how do i feel what do i want to do about pride um how do i want to experience pride what's safe for me i've worked with a lot of folks who say pride is their least favorite month of the year um i don't want to think about pride i don't want to know about pride i don't want to experience pride um i am who i am i'm fine with who i am i'm good with who i am but i don't want any of this big hoopla around uh june it's just too scary um and i think that you know there is so much for us to unpack there um and i think a lot of it has to do with internalized you know homophobia, transphobia, whatever. And I think a lot of it has to do with fear um, and fear of, you know, am I queer enough? Am I trans enough? Am I gay enough? Am I straight enough? Am I this enough? Am I that enough? Fear around safety, fear around all kinds of things. Um, and it's, it's why I think, you know, each and every one of us, especially those who work with LGBT folks, has to be aware that like for some folks this month is going to be a month of like great joy and celebration this month may be a month of like lock up the doors and batten down the hatches and i don't want to talk to anyone or see anyone or do anyone or do anything um for some folks it's going to be about you know 
poking my little head out of, of, of the door and, and sort of seeing what this looks like. And it's different for every single person. And I think that's what we have to continue to always think about. Um, yeah, I guess I'll kind of leave it at that. I'm switching to this um, Voices of, of Pride for a moment. These are all quotes from um, the wonderful internet um, on what pride means uh, to me. And I share this with you to sort of share some of what I think I'm seeing in, in the chat. Um, some of maybe, um, maybe I'm being biased here um, because I'm sharing the more positive ones and certainly I could have found the more negative ones. Um, but I'm wanting to share a bit, certainly after I just shared that really horrible slide about all the terrible reasons, uh, terrible things that are moving us into Pride Month. Um, but I'm wanting to share some of what pride can mean for folks in the sense of freedom and acceptance and celebration and family and learning to love yourself. Because again, uh, to come back to, to Doug's word, this is really a movement from, or has been a movement from, from me to we, um, and giving people an opportunity to embrace authenticity, um, embrace acceptance, embrace survival, um, on whatever scale or sense that is for them. Um, and I think that especially those of, of you on the call who work clinically and who work with folks um, who are scared um, and who have every right to be scared right now, it's a scary time right now. Um, there is an awful lot of good stuff that is happening right now. And there's an awful lot of um, joy to be found. And there's awful lot of, um, acceptance to be found. And this is a, a, a unique month in particular for allies to show up and for other queer folks to show up and to, um, help folks in feeling that sense of we, and, um, it's a, a unique opportunity for that. Um, so I am going to show one more thing and then I'm going to open up to um, a sort of question and answer sort of thing. But I'm going to uh, show one more thing that is uh, sort of something unique that we're going to be doing for Pride this year. And I'm going to invite all of you to join in with us. Oh, uh, local Pride events, please um, come join. I tried to put as many local Pride events. These are parades and festivals. Of course, there's tons of Pride events that are happening throughout the state, um, but these are just local Pride uh, events and festivals and things like that that are happening. Lauren mentioned it before. Um, we're gonna be at Brunswick Pride this coming weekend. Uh, if you're gonna be there, please come find us and uh, talk to us and, and chat with us. Um, we're also gonna be at Portland Pride next weekend. Um, so we'd love to see you um, and chat with you about the work that we're doing. Um, at the uh, the new center that we're creating for LGBT community supports, um, where we where, where we are creating not only clinical services for the community, but also services for uh, queer and allied providers. So if that's something that is of interest to you, please 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 come by and talk with us. Um, you can also always shoot me an email and uh, learn more about what we're doing. But um, this is a project that we're really working on that is focused on community building, community building for our providers, as well as for our patients. So um, if this is, again, something that's of interest to you, please uh, get in touch. But um, you all will get a copy of my slides, so you have all this information so you can find the festivals and those kinds of things. Um, hope you get out to a Pride event um, this year. They're some of the most wonderful events um, I'll be there um, at Brunswick and Portland. My family will be with me. And it's uh, one of the things I love doing most is having my, my three-year-old with me at these events um, and introducing him to pride uh, and those kinds of things. This is what I wanted to share with you. This is an event, uh, this is an experience that we're gonna be doing at Pride, um, both at, uh, at Brunswick and in Portland. Um, Feel free, please, to take your phones out and scan it across this QR code right now. Or uh, again, you'll have a copy of this and you can use our link. Um, I think there's real power in Pride. And my focus is on uh, building community and building community through Pride. And we're going to be doing that with a little art project um, this uh, year at uh, both Brunswick and Portland Pride. Um, so if you click on our link or if you use our QR code, 
Um, what it will bring up is a question for you. What I hope it will bring up, I'm not really super technology savvy, but I think I set it up correctly, um, is a QR code that's going to ask you a question about when you think about pride, it makes you feel. And it's going to give you an opportunity to share a couple of words, one, two, three, it's up to you. Um, and all of these different words from all of these hundreds of people that we're going to have the opportunity to um, interact with over the course of the next couple of weeks of pride um, are going to be uh, used to create what I hope is going to be a wonderful, unique art uh, piece that will commemorate pride 2023. Um, so I sincerely hope you all will join us in um, commemorating uh, this wonderful time of year, this community building time of year, this opportunity to think about pride and the power that we find in pride, in this sort of we-ness, if that's a word, um, and, um, and join us in this uh, unique and wonderful activity. So um, again, you'll have access to that if you aren't able to scan it today, you'll have access to it. Um, in the next day or so when Lauren sends out all of our slides. Um, I'm gonna stop here and stop sharing and so I can see all of your wonderful faces and um, and then answer any questions um, if you'd like uh, before we have to jump out of here. I just wanna commend you for a wonderful presentation. I found it fascinating and absolutely to the point. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. I think it's uh, really important that we keep on fighting back in this way because otherwise we're going to lose. You know, they, we don't want them to keep us running and losing our rights piece by piece. So I appreciate this work and, and the work on pride in general. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think that there is, you know, I, I work with a lot of folks um, who do this work, like queer professionals who do this work in the legal field, in the mental health field, in um, the medical field. And while there is this unique sense of like, this is a really, really tough time for our community. There's also this sense of like, we're, we're not giving up the fight, right? Like we have been fighting for literally decades and like, the, and we're not going down, you know, like we're not going down now. And while it's, it's particularly hard now, I have, I have been a part of, and I have watched and I have um, been on, you know, meetings where there's, there is amazing amazing work that's being done in various helping professions um, to figure out like where do we go from here and how do we keep people from feeling um, discouraged and how do we keep people from feeling broken down and how do we build community and how do we create access and, and how do we do all of those things so 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 when when I work with patients in particular that's what I'm what I'm bringing to the table yeah I know this is hard I know this is is particularly difficult time, but here's how we build from here. Here's what we do from, from here. Is that my focus is on and continually on like the community connectedness piece of what we're doing. Um, because I think that's where we're strongest and that's where we've always been strongest. If you go back to you know 1959, right? Like that's where we've always been strongest is in community. Um, and, and so that's where I, I think if we can all think that way, that's where we're going to be the strongest. As I recall, walking down Fifth Avenue in New York and my first gay pride walk in 1971 and seeing the people standing in front of uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral chanting and jeering at us and the surprised people on the side signs uh, attacking us, it was scary. And uh, we've come a great long ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, frankly, the advent of gay marriage has probably led people to attack the trans community because the rest of us have gotten so strong and so integrated into society. And that's the only way they can really attack us. So I think, you know, there's a lot more strength and success that we can be very, very proud of to celebrate. And we need to protect our trans and gender questioning brothers and sisters and everyone, but we've come a long ways and we've got a lot of support. We just need to demonstrate that and stand proud mm -hmm. and recognize this is part of a larger attack on all kinds of freedoms in this country. 
Don't forget that the first book burning was in Nazi Germany uh, of the Gay Library and the Hirschfeld Institute uh, that was focused on these issues. So, uh, you know, this is a part of a general move toward authoritarianism in the world, and we need to stand proud and resist. Yeah. I, I appreciate um, Doug so much of what you've been sharing throughout this, and 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 sharing about your first parade. I so appreciate that. Um, I think what I, I think there. I mean, I I I think I'm just going to keep saying it because I believe in it so strongly. There, we as a community have been fighting for so long, and we have come so far. And we have so far left to go, right? I, I believe so strongly in that, but I believe that it is community that is going to continue to move us forward. Um, and and I'm, I'm seeing Flower, thank you so much for sharing this. We have so many tremendous resources in the state of Maine, out Maine, um, uh, uh, Maine Transnet, we have um, the Equality Community Center. I mean, so many of them. Um, and this is a wonderful state to be to be getting and gaining resource and access to community in. And PSM is is just a small part of that. What we hope to be a larger part of that very soon, but a small part of that right now. And we are we are creating and 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 connecting to and collaborating with the folks who can help us to to create more um, in terms of mental health services, in terms of resources, in terms of all of those things. So um, I so appreciate all of you being here. I so appreciate you taking hour of your time to uh, learn about pride, to talk about pride, to think about pride. Um, please, please, please um, share your words uh, so that you can be part of our amazing art project. Um, please join us um, at the Pride Celebrations. Um, please stop by and say hi and introduce yourselves if you're going to be at Brunswick Pride or Portland Pride. And uh, thank you so much for being here. So appreciate it. Happy Pride, everyone. Yeah, thank you all so much um, again for your thoughts, your energy, your time, your donations. Um, you'll get an email, it'll go out in just a minute with a copy of the slides, a link to the eval. It's anonymous, it helps us um, do more of kind of what you all want. Um, we hope to see you at Pride and we're hosting an in person conference in um, Freeport in October with a stellar lineup of main. Um, providers and scholars. And so um, we'll get information out about that soon. So thank you all so much for being here.